Exactly. <laughs> I accidentally. Or into Eric's base there. We're live. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, so let's uh, go ahead and get started, I guess. Um, today we're here to talk about upgrading OpenStack. Uh, you know, in, in theory, we're going to not break everything. Uh, and in theory, we're not even going to break Neutron, which is a big feat. Uh, uh, just a little bit of introductions. Uh, I'm Clayton O'Neill. I'm principal engineer at Time Warner Cable. Um, I focus on automation, CICD, deployment, that sort of stuff. And I'm Sean Lynn, also a principal engineer at Time Warner, and focuses on Neutron and Nova. Uh, just a little bit of background. Um, uh, our OpenStack uh, team formed with about four people about two years ago. Uh, not about four people, four people. Uh, we did our proof of concept implementation on Havana. Um, after the Atlanta summit, we decided to uh, quickly move to Icehouse and VXLAN based networking and uh, before we went to production last summer. Uh, since then, we've done an upgrade to Juno and Kilo. And um, as you can see here, these are the versions that we're currently running in our production environments. Um, this talk's going to focus on our last round of control node upgrades, which included uh, Nova, Neutron, Glance, uh, Sender, and Heat. Uh, since our Kilo upgrade, we've actually upgraded Heat to uh, one of the uh, Liberty Betas um, by moving that into a Docker container. Uh, Horizon and Keystone, are we're not going to cover. We were actually already on Kilo for those things. So uh, there are a few core tenants that we feel are important as far as doing up OpenStack upgrades. Uh, one of the big ones is uh, don't fall behind. Uh, I'm not sure how these guys got on the treadmill. They'd never be able to get back on. Uh, but we plan on upgrading every six months. Um, we think that you probably should too. Um, part of this is uh, uh, just because that's the only tested path. Um, but also with changes that are occurring uh, with rolling upgrades and lazy database migrations, um, it's sometimes just not possible now. So a good example of this is uh, the Nova flavor migrations that came along with Kilo. That's a step that you have to do on Kilo before you can move to Liberty. Uh, also, uh, you want to automate everything. Um, because if you don't automate everything, um, you're going to end up feeling kind of like this guy. Um, you want to test this over and over and over again. You want to get your process down. Uh, and important, one of really important is to um, figure out what the impact to your customers is going to be. And that was a big focus for us on our Kilo upgrade. So our, uh, our team gave an upgrades talk at Vancouver. Uh, some of you may have been to that. If any of you wanted to hear us talk about upgrades twice in one year, then thank you. Um, we're going to try and not cover too much of the same ground. We're going to talk about updates to um, that approach, things that are new and how we handle that with Kilo, and also talk about some of the problems we ran into with Kilo. Uh, so whenever we were deciding uh, the timing for our Kilo upgrade, there was one major feature that we were looking for. Um, uh, that was AMQP Heartbeats. Uh, like most people using OpenStack, we're using RabbitMQ for uh, all of our intra-service uh, communication. And like most people that are doing that, uh, we've had a lot of problems going down that path. And um, you know, the biggest remaining problem that we had with Juno was just that if anything went wrong uh, with Rabbit or network connectivity or what have you, we would frequently see services thinking that they were connected to RabbitMQ, not really being connected. Uh, and no Nova Compute was a big problem with this. We would have instances get scheduled to a compute node, and it would never pick up the request. So AMQP heartbeats are a uh, protocol level feature that allows uh, RabbitMQ and the clients to talk to each other on a regular basis and check in. And if any of them kind of go missing, uh, they can clean everything up and um, you know, reconnect and kind of get back in a good state. So this was an experimental feature added in Kilo, but we'd heard good things about it. We knew people that were using it. As with any process, you have to know your requirements before you start down that. And that's the balance of your technical abilities and also your customer needs. Um, <clears throat> What we would like to do is forklift everything. It's super easy. Uh, replace, there's a ton of downtime involved, so obviously customers don't like that. Another option that we could do is more like a pit stop. Uh, go in, shorter, you know, shorter full outage, but uh, just change everything out really quick. And we also like that because we were able to take advantage of that downtime to not have to play tricks with the system and, and uh, overcome a lot of technical liabilities. The problem is our customers don't want any downtime. So they want something like this. 
Now, if you, it's a great YouTube video. Go online. Uh, these guys actually, in, in the course of five minutes, change both of these tires. Our problem is actually more difficult. Our problem is changing all four tires at the same time while the vehicle's rolling. And uh, to this end, we had these basic requirements. It's the same ones we had in Juno, and it's the same tenants that we have to follow. An API outage is OK. We can take 10 or 15 minutes of customers not being able to hit the APIs, but nothing else can go out. No connectivity between uh, instances, uh, no storage outages, uh, and no rebooting of uh, customer workloads. But we did have some improvements, lessons learned after our uh, uh, Juno upgrade. <clears throat> we changed the time of day that we upgraded. What was comfortable for us, which was uh, later in the evening but not so late, was actually super uncomfortable for our users. So we had to move our upgrades to the middle of the night, kind of a 2 AM time period. Um, <clears throat> we also improved by testing uh, production data from both systems. Obviously, uh, we started running into a few issues here and there by data set size differences, and then actu the actual data needed to be tested. So we pulled that back into our development cycle for the upgrade. And one of our chief uh, faux pas of the uh, Juno upgrade was that we did have some network outages and customers were impacted. So we spent a lot of time studying why that happened and trying to prevent that for the Kilo upgrade. Um, and back to the sizing issue we talked about, or I just talked about for production data, uh, we also added size to our, our development workloads to try to simulate our production environment and run test cycles through that before we even got, uh, got to the full size. Uh, so we talked about how important upgrade automation is earlier. I just want to touch on that briefly. Um, all of our upgrade automation is doing, done using Ansible uh, to drive Puppet. Uh, so Puppet ends up being responsible for our package upgrades, uh, config changes, service restarts, that sort of thing. Uh, and we use Ansible to handle pretty much everything else, so orchestration and ordering uh, during that process. So this is something we covered in a fair amount of depth in the Vancouver talk, if you're interested in more detail on that. Um, so one of the advantages of doing this with Juno is, is that whenever we went to go do Kilo, we were able to basically take that, make a snapshot of it, and start from there. And we were actually able to reuse almost everything that we had done for Juno uh, and then add on to that. So we're looking forward to reusing that also. Um, so with that, let's talk a little bit about what the actual upgrade process looks like. Um, so this is what our starting point looks like for our control cluster. We have three control nodes uh, in each of our environments. Each node hosts all the services that we're going to be upgrading, plus a bunch of virtual routers. Um, they're also part of a shared MySQL and RabbitMQ cluster. And um, external users talk to these nodes via a hardware load balancer. Um, what's not shown in this diagram is that we also have HA, HA proxy based load balancer that we use for all the internal communications. And we'll talk about that, why that's important a little bit later. Um, so let's go through the steps of the actual upgrade um, and keep in mind that this is all automated using Ansible. Uh, so the goal of the first step is really to take the first two control nodes out of service um, and upgrade that first node. So we do that by, we start doing that by uh, taking uh, MySQL down with two of the nodes. We do backups in case we have to do some sort of rollback. Um, and then next we need to get all those routers off of that first control node. So what we're trying to avoid here is, is that uh, until Liberty, there's a problem with the OVS agent, uh, where whenever it starts up, it just deletes all of the network flows, which causes an outage. So our goal here is to never tr uh, to avoid doing an upgrade on a node that has an OVS agent running on it where we need it. So to do that, we're using uh, L3 agent failover. So um, we shut down the L3 agent on the first control node uh, the, after some period of time. The second and third ones notice that, hey, the, the first guy went away, and uh, they start building out the, all the um, plumbing that needs to be done for those routers, and uh, the traffic all moves over. So uh, this, leaves us at, this leaves us in a situation where we're functional. We have one node up. It's a cluster of one. Uh, and so the next step we take is, is that we actually turn on, we disable the L3 agent on that first node uh, administratively via the Neutron API. And the reason that's important is that whenever we actually finish doing our upgrade, that L3 agent's going to come back up, and we don't want all the routers to move back over automatically. 
Uh, and then the last thing before we actually start our API outage, and this is one of the improvements we made in Kilo, is we get a list of all the instances and the floating IPs uh, associated with them. And the reason we do this is because we want to do uh, monitoring of connectivity to those. Um, and we want to be able to report on the status of whether or not we're losing connectivity to those. And this was a really instrumental whenever we were doing our development of this process to figure out what the impact was going to be for our customers. So we start the API outage by turning off the external load balancer. We did run some issues here. We're going to cover that later. Uh, and then we shut down OpenStack services on all of the uh, control nodes. The goal here is to not have any Juno services running and trying to talk to a Kilo database during the upgrade. Uh, the routers continue to function because that's all kernel level functionality, so there's not anything, uh, any software that's handling that. And then to actually kick off our upgrade, we run Puppet on that first control node, and that goes through and upgrades all the packages, makes the config file changes, restarts the services. Um, there's two things to note about that. Because we have our external load balancer turned off, um, we're actually setting an environment variable, the OS endpoint type, um, to force that to use internal URL. Uh, and that way it goes through HA proxy instead of the public endpoints. Uh, and we also set the Nova, Nova API compat flag so that our Judo compute nodes will still be able to talk to Kilo uh, control services. So once we get to this point, we um, run a simple smoke test uh, using the CLI clients to make sure that basic functionality is there before we move on any further. And um, at that point, that's successful. We want to start trying to get everything back to normal because we're still on an outage. So at this point, we can enable the L3 agent on this box. It's up and running. We validated base functionality. Um, it starts trying to figure out, hey, who's still alive? And uh, after some short period of time, it realizes, hey, control nodes 2 and 3 have disappeared. They have all these routers. So it starts plumbing out everything. All the routers get moved over. Um, there was some complexity that's involved in this. We'll cover this a little bit later. Um, and then we want to re-enable the load balancer. So at this point, we're out of outage. We're back to a single node uh, cluster. Um, but we're running Kilo on that node, so that's where we want to be. Um, the length of time for this outage is basically uh, tied to how long it takes to move those routers, how long it takes to actually install packages, and how long it takes to run database migrations. The rest of it's pretty minor in terms of the amount, the amount of time. Uh, so we can relax a little bit at this point, but we still have two more control nodes to upgrade. Uh, so the first step here is we want to get the MySQL cluster back up and running. So we bring MySQL back up on those other two nodes. They rejoin the Galera cluster. Um, the nice thing here is, is that Galera will automatically make sure that any of the changes that occurred during the upgrade get replicated to those, those other two nodes. So we don't have to worry about running database migrations and the time required to do that on the other two nodes. Uh, so we run Puppet on each of those two nodes. They do the same thing that it already did on the first one, brings them up, fixes the config files, gets us in a good state. Uh, so at this point, we're nearly done. Um, the problem that we have is all of our routers are still in one box. That's kind of not a good place to be. Um, we already have tools for rebalancing those uh, and trying to avoid high-profile tenants. Um, you know, there is situations where that can cause some impact, a little bit of missed traffic. And so we rebalance those, and at this point, we're pretty much done with our control nodes. Um, this is where we start doing a lot more testing. Um, we start doing, uh, we have some Canary instances running on the compute nodes. We make sure live migration still works. Um, we have a pretty extensive regression uh, test suite. We run that, make sure that volume attach and all the other complicated things still need to work. Uh, and we spend a little bit of time going through all the logs, just make sure we don't have any services that are spinning, that they're not logging any errors that we didn't expect, that sort of thing. So to finish the upgrade, we need to get the compute nodes upgraded. Um, and that's a lot easier than the control nodes, but it's still something we want to be careful about. Um, so we evacuate a couple of the compute nodes, and we bring up some instances on those for testing. And we validate base functionality again. So does live migration work? Does volume attach, detach? Uh, that, those sort of things work. Once we've verified that, um, we just go ahead and do a normal deploy to those compute nodes. It's going to upgrade the packages. Um, now, this does cause a short outage because the OVS agent's going to get restarted, but because we have so much less flows on a compute node, that's much briefer. Um, we could do a live migration to avoid that, but it's kind of choosing between what type of impact you want to have to customers. Uh, all told, uh, the upgrade process took uh, less than three hours per region. A lot of that's doing validation. Um, and we did the two regions on separate nights, unfortunately, as Sean mentioned, in the middle of the night. Uh, so the last thing we have to do is uh, merge a change to turn that Nova API compat flag back off, and we just rolled that out in our next normal deploy. In 
designing the kilo upgrade, we had to make a couple uh, couple changes to improve the outage window or reduce the outage window uh, on networking. We're using uh, VXLAN, OVS, um, if you can't tell from this slide. Uh, the first thing we realized is that after you take that layer two agent down, um, there's a timer in the OVS Mac learning that starts to time out on active flows. Um, you have about five minutes total duration, but flows start to trickle out and die within that five minutes and customers start losing traffic. And it's very confusing the first time you run into it because it's just sporadic. Um, so what we did is we went into OBS on all the control nodes, uh, tweaked out the timeout. You can see the hard timeout of 300. We upgraded that five minute timeout to about half an hour. And then we had a wait period that waited for those uh, active flows to be respawned. So we just waited a little over five minutes. Um, it drastically reduces the amount of timeout that you actually experience. <laughs> uh, there were still a few things that were unavoidable. Um, as Clayton mentioned, uh, when you start up the L2 agent, at least until uh, Liberty, uh, it flushes all those flows out. Not the shutdown, the start up flushes all those flows. So we changed our Ansible and puppetry to avoid that at all costs or at very key points so we could pinpoint that outage. Um, <clears throat> the third thing that we ran into is that uh, when you have a massive number of legacy routers on a single control node, uh, Kilo and, and before, uh, that buildup of transferring all those routers to a different control node or restarting is a very lengthy process. We have uh, 50 or 60 routers on a control node. Uh, taking that, that's about 2,500 flows and rebuilding that and all the namespaces and everything underneath the, the plumbing underneath the hood takes about 10 to 15 minutes, and that's a massive uh, um, <coughs> user outage. The other thing that we did, because we couldn't use uh, HA routers, with the VRRP HA routers, uh, we were using L2POP. There's an existing bug that's just been fixed. Uh, so we decided to abuse L3 or L2 agent. It's not designed for this. Um, L2 agent HA should be DR. It's designed when you unplug the uh, <coughs> you unplug the L2 agent. There's a timer that goes down, and then it automatically reschedules and distributes your router across your other uh, network nodes. Um, it's not designed for what we were doing, <laughs> but it actually pre-populates all the flows, sends out a gratuitous ARP, and you have very little uh, uh, user outage on this. The problem with this is it assumes that the original control node is down hard. Um, so you end up with a situation where in a lot of these routers you have two endpoints that exist. So here's how we overcame a couple of these things. Um, basically, I talked about this. We upped the uh, OBS uh, flow timeouts and then did that wait process. Um, do not uh, restart OBS agent. And I just made a note that uh, down at the bottom is, as of the Kilo upgrade, we had to go through some of these procedures. Um, uh, as of Liberty, that flow flushing doesn't happen. There's a good transaction mechanism that minimizes that. And uh, we should soon have the HA router L2 pop bug <laughs> fix. Um, where I wanted to get to is the uh, <coughs> abuse of the uh, L3 agent HA required us to go onto that original control node that we, we turned down and every, all the routers were migrated off of there. We had to hand delete all the namespaces, all the uh, OVS uh, ports, everything, uh, all the flows related to that. Um, by manual, I mean we programmed Ansible to run a job just to do that for us. So how did all this upgrade and the upgrade testing go? A uh, good analogy is uh, Tropical Storm Kilo, ironically. Uh, it kind of wandered across the Pacific over three weeks, gradually losing steam and didn't really go anywhere. Um, the only part of the analogy is that we wished is we'd only had a three-week period to do all our testing. Ours took much longer.
So here's some of the problems that we ran to, into during the upgrade. The Nova configuration of Cinder <laughs> changed locations between Juno and Kilo. It's partly a little documentation glitch that either we didn't pick up and it was a lightly documented, let's put it that way. Um, the way we ran into this was our first data center went great. In the second data center, we, we ran out, we ran through our full production deploy and transition, and we tried to mount a cinder volume and create a cinder volume, and everything failed. What it was trying to do is it didn't know which data center it should be in, so it created the volume, but then was looking in the opposite data center for the actual volume. Um, <coughs> this is a release note thing. It was actually deprecated in Juno, but uh, it was, we missed it. It's actually not documented in the Kilo release notes, so that was a doc miss. Uh, Python Neutron client, uh, we have hundreds and hundreds of tenant networks. When that list gets super long, uh, one version of the Python Neutron client would just uh, return an error. Uh, it was actually fixed, uh, a bug fixed, but because of uh, our canonical packaging, it wasn't, uh, and also the documentation, it wasn't uh, packaged right in the release that we got, so we had to uh, downgrade to avoid that bug. That's since definitely been fixed. Um, as part of the Python Neutron client downgrade, and this happened only in our development environment, uh, as, a, as a set of requirements list on the packages, uh, we got a whole bunch of things uninstalled. One of those was uh, Nova. And this is development. We never made it to production with this. But uh, um, <coughs> as part of the Nova upgrade, uh, Flavors need to be migrated, and this happens lazily. It's actually a pretty interesting way to do it. As the flavor is uh, accessed, then that database translation and the migration takes place. Seems really cool until you've, you've uh, had some hiccup that uh, partly migrates things and leaves bad data. Again, this was only in development, but we had to manually fix the database to move on. Uh, one of the things that we got really bit with for quite a while after the upgrade. Uh, we, we had a whole bunch of tenant instances that started losing IP. People calling, going, ah, my instance, I can't get in my instance, I can't get in my instance. What we found out is that uh, new feature of allow automatic DHCP failover defaulted to on, super lightly documented. <laughs> um, meaning not mentioned at all in the release notes. But uh, it's pretty buggy, and for us, we don't need it. Uh, it manifested itself by a lot of false positives where it would try to rebuild the DHCP agents on another uh, network node, and then fail partway through that, and then uh, instance, or tenant networks weren't having uh, instance uh, DHCP at all. Took us a couple weeks to figure that one out. Track it down. Once we turn that off, everything seems to be uh, calmed down. Uh, so, as I talked about before, um, we had a validation uh, process in place for um, you know, using the CLI clients to make sure that uh, base functionality was there for all the services. Uh, and our plan was to turn off the external load balancer uh, and use the internal endpoints for that. So we ran into a problem. Um, you know, you can change which endpoint any of the CLI clients use by either setting an environment variable or a command line option. And so we were doing that in all the places that we should be. Uh, specifically, the Neutron and Sender clients just um, completely ignored this. R would use it only whenever they were talking to Keystone, uh, which is not really very helpful. Um, so this broke our puppet runs. It broke our smoke test stuff. Um, unfortunately, we found this, this problem really late in the process, and we actually ended up uh, deciding to leave the external load balancers on. That's something that we're going to test better um, whenever we go to do future upgrades so that we don't have this issue. Uh, we were also ran into some schema problems with Glance. So in Kilo, Nova started using the V2 Glance API. Um, the V2 Glance API does schema validation on all the objects that it returns, which is a good idea. Um, but the V1 API doesn't. Um, so what that meant is that you could create images via the V1 API uh, that the V2 API couldn't actually manipulate. Uh, so we saw this originally, where we had a bunch of images where in the database the description of the image was null. Um, and uh, the V2 API thought that you couldn't have null images, it wanted them to be empty strings. 
So uh, what would happen is you'd go to boot an instance off of this, and some instances would work, some instances wouldn't work, and it was kind of um, not obvious what was going on. So, and there was also no way to tell Nova to go back to the V1 API. Um, so we ended up opening a bug upstream. We worked with Flavio from the Glance team. I think we actually got a fix for this the same day. The canonical guys pulled in packages. This was a really quick turnaround. Those guys were all really great. And we ran into another problem that was really similar later on. Um, it, there's also some attributes that are handled via a, uh, a schema JSON file. And uh, this time, the attributes were kernel ID and RAM disk ID. Uh, we had a lot of images where this was null, and they thought that they couldn't be null. So the fix for this was just to update the config file, um, and that was actually the fix that had already been addressed upstream. Um, so we just pulled that in. Um, we've been really good at finding MySQL bugs whenever we do our upgrade, so this was an interesting one. And our, dev, our uh, first uh, dev environment upgrade, we found this problem where uh, Nova migrations want to take a column and convert it from being nullable to not null. Uh, this is failing because in MySQL 5.6, uh, there's a bug that prevents you from doing this if there's a foreign key constraint on there just across the board. Um, this, the weird thing about this isn't that we ran into this bug. It, the weird thing is, is that it didn't happen in all of our environments. Um, we do have a support contract with Bracona. We went to Bracona, we explained to them what was going on, went back and forth a lot. Um, but eventually they came back, we had a bug opened up on the, uh, um, uh, with Bracona. They got that fixed, it's been pushed upstream, so if you're using MySQL 5.6, you probably want to be running that version. Another database problem we have, if you see a really horrible error message like this, it's pretty opaque. Um, the issue here we ran into was sender with data, sender database migrations, but it's kind of a general problem. Um, it's important that the sort order on all of the databases and columns and tables match whenever it's doing foreign key constraints. So the problem that we ran into specifically is, is that uh, the puppet modules that we use had one UTF sort order. It changed, they standardized across all the, all the modules at some point. Uh, and so whenever we went to go run these migrations, the database was set this way, all the old tables were set another way, and whenever it created a new table, tried to set up that relationship between them, it would just fail completely. Um, so this is just a good thing to audit. If you see this weird error message, you dig into it, you're gonna, um, you may run into this. And this can happen for any migration. It's not Kilo specific, it's just a database issue. Uh, another issue we ran into is that um, the Keystone middleware um, was moved into its own package in Juno, um, but Juno still supported the old library names. So in Kilo, those old library names were removed. Uh, that seems reasonable, but it wasn't mentioned in the release notes. Um, so the control nodes that we had that were the, our oldest, uh, the ones that we had upgraded from Icehouse, they still had the old ones in place, uh, and we'd kind of missed this whenever, after we were doing, finished our Juno upgrade. So this was an easy fix once we finished it. Um, but issues like this are particularly hard to find because the normal mechanisms in Oslo config for reporting deprecations don't work here. This is kind of a freeform field and it can't check this. Uh, last but not least, we found this problem after our first prod upgrade at two o'clock in the morning, after we had turned API services back on. Um, there's a new feature in Nova Scheduler called Scheduler Tracks Instance Changes. And um, what this is supposed to do is that give scheduler filters uh, the ability to more information about making scheduler uh, decisions. So this is the commit message for that. Uh, so the way this works is whenever the scheduler starts up, it starts pulling all your compute nodes in batches of 10. And uh, our experience, what this meant is, is that while it was doing that, it was chewing up 100% of a core. Nothing else was going on during Nova Scheduler. Uh, originally, we saw this is that RabbitMQ was getting disconnected, um, and we think that was probably Heartbeats getting starved out. Uh, but even after we turned off Heartbeats to kind of rule that out, um, we still saw instances just not getting scheduled. So um, we don't use any scheduler filters right now, so we didn't need this. We turned it off. Um, the biggest issue with this is the, you see there's a doc impact tag here that's supposed to open a bug upstream. This didn't get into the release notes. We found out about this quote unquote feature uh, during our prod upgrade. So uh, after we ran into all those issues, um, this is about how we felt. Uh, for those of you that haven't seen Groundhog Day, you should. Um, just to kind of summarize those, a lot of the problems that we ran into were really kind of because we didn't look closely at the release notes. 
Um, we read all the Kilo release notes. We felt like we were good. We didn't read the Juno release notes to do our Kilo upgrade, and that was a big part of our problem. Those deprecations that were, things were deprecated in Juno just weren't documented as removed in Kilo, so we didn't think about that. Um, MySQL has bugs. Um, we're good at finding them. Uh, you know, part of the reason that we do upgrades is because we want new features and, you know, bug fixes. Um, but at least two of the problems that we ran into were because of new features that didn't work well and were poorly documented. You know, and so buggy services are one thing, but if I don't know about that new feature, uh, it's not actually all that helpful to me. Um, to, you know, give credit where credit's due, uh, some projects are better than others about doing release notes, and it does vary from release to release. The Center guys did a really great job on the Kilo stuff. Um, if you go and look at the Liberty release notes, the Nova guys did a wonderful job there also. So with that litany of issues that we ran into, you kind of be, maybe think it's like, well, is this really worthwhile? Um, well, one, as we talked about before, we don't really have much of a choice. We have to upgrade to stay current. Um, but after resolving all these issues, stability has improved significantly. Uh, MQB heartbeats have been a good, a, a large chunk of that. A lot, most of the issues that we've run into there in the past have been resolved. Um, we do uh, still see some intermittent problems with Nova Compute getting disconnected during these same sort of events that we did before, but really not, not anywhere else. Um, so just to wrap up, um, talk about uh, upgrading to Liberty real quick. Um, we've already started some of that work. We've been working on getting our Puppet modules up to date. We're pretty close to master on all of our modules except for Keystone. We've got a couple things to work out. Um, you know, we don't really know what our timing for our Liberty upgrade is going to be yet, but I'm pretty sure it'll be before Austin. Um, we also know that we're just going to run into weird problems. Um, the Kilo really taught us that. We thought we were experts after doing Juno, and Kilo kind of taught us that that's not a thing that exists. Um, we're also going to continue moving services into containers. We've had good luck with that with Heat and Designate. That's allowed us to upgrade uh, those services or not upgrade them in the case of Designate. Um, the issue there for us is really that we want to run multiple services on a, on a node, um, and the Python dependencies make that really hard unless you have some way of isolating them from each other. Uh, another big part of that also is just that installing the packages takes a long time. With uh, containers, we can pre-stage that ahead of time and then just shut down the old container and bring up the new one. That saves us some time during our upgrades. Uh, also, a lot of the complexity in our upgrades has to do with working around these OBS agent issues where the flows get cleared, and that's fixed in Liberty. Uh, so we're really looking forward to that. And uh, lastly, we're hoping to move to HA routers. Uh, whenever, once we get on Liberty, the L2 pop bug that Sean's talked about is uh, addressed in there. And um, if we don't have to move routers around during our upgrades, we feel like that's going to make things go a lot more smoothly also. Uh, so that's what we've got. We appreciate everybody coming. Um, I know that you're all probably hungry and want to go to lunch, but if anybody's got any questions, we'll be glad to answer them. Uh, and we do have a mic up here, but I can repeat your question, worst case. Yes, sir. Oh, hold on. You were thinking about using distributed Ubuntu to other routers to resolve some of the issues you have in moving the router during the controller upgrade to the L3 kind of LB version. So I've followed DVR, and I... Uh, I mean, it's definitely an option in sometime in the future. I just don't quite feel it's there for our use case. There's still some bugs in that that need to be worked out, so we're, we're taking the safe approach. I think somebody in the back had a question. Yeah. But he may be really hungry. Ah, uh, okay. Why aren't we using DVR? Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yes. Uh, no, we, we've looked at Cola and uh, we're following Cola. Um, there's some um, features we want as far as like specifically with designate. Um, we have a custom designate sync, and today that's kind of hard to get into the container. I, they have that on their roadmap. That's something we've been talking to them about. So um, ideally, we'd like to start using uh, Cola, but we're not there yet. Okay. Well, well thank I guess everybody. Oh, can go we got lunch. one more. Thank you very much. Oh, yes. We try to. Yeah. So the question was, do we upstream the bugs that we found? Um, a lot of times we actually find that there's already a bug on it. That's how we realize that this problem that we found is uh, not us. 
Um, so a lot of these we went and we looked and it was already fixed. Uh, the glance one that we found it had not been reported yet and uh, I think that that was one of the reasons we were able to get such good results back is that it was blocking our upgrade and uh, the glance team was really interested in helping us. I'm sorry, what was that? Dev discussions. So specifically on the, uh, the DHCP failover issue, we did bring that up on the mailing list. Um, we didn't get a lot of feedback on that at the time. There's been since been other people that have run into the same problem, and there are upstream bugs against that. Uh, one of the reasons, one of the ways we actually found that found that that was the issue we were running into was actually going and looking on the master branch at the number of fixes that were in the DHCP in the DHCP failover code, um, and seeing that only a couple of those had actually been backported. So, um, if we get stuck, that's kind of where we end up. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.